Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fund Your Retirement Podcast. Today I'm joined by Mark Simpson, full-time investor and published author of the book Excellent Investing, a practical guide for investors who are looking to elevate their investment performance to the next level. Mark Simpson has been investing in individual stocks since 2003, and over the last decade, Mark has generated a 19% compound annual return following a value methodology. He has achieved this outperformance by developing a strategy that plays to his unique strengths and overcomes his weaknesses, and in particular, finding practical ways to overcome behavioral biases. Over the next 30 minutes, Mark shares his investing journey and demonstrates his stock picking methodology by breaking down a company from his portfolio that he holds a high conviction in. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us today on the FYR podcast. Hi, Lee. Good to see you. What was it that got you started in your investing journey then? What was the catalyst that kind of got you going? Technically, my first investment was the shares I gained in the 90s when I was, I was 18 as part of the Halifax demutualization. So it was ah, that right, time yeah. where if you're above 18, you got these shares. And I, I didn't really understand what they were. They paid me a, a dividend every now and then. I, and I just didn't do anything with them until probably my sort of early to mid twenties around t kind of 2002, I was like, oh, I've got these shares. What mm. are they? And <laughs> in, in some ways, thankfully I was a lot of the dot com boom stuff just passed me by. It wasn't on my radar, but I, I started to look and clicked a link through to the Motley Fool UK. So if you remember that, yeah, I think they still going as a, as a, a publisher, but the discussion boards were the things I really found, which were big at the time. And yeah, just became fascinated by that world and went from a, a couple of index trackers to starting to purchase my own shares and eventually thankfully sold the Halifax shares before the financial crisis and reinvested them elsewhere. And in the early years with quite mixed success, really. So when you got those shares, were you working with Halifax at the time then? Is that how you ended up? No, it right. was, if you were a, just, if you were a saver, you got the shares. It's, Understood. I think my sister was too young and got about a hundred quid which just wasn't anywhere near worth as much as the shares were. So it was, uh, I was lucky on both cases that I was just old enough to get them. It's fascinating learning how people actually got started on their journey. And yours was just as simple as that. So how did you go from there to writing your book, Excellent Investing? What inspired you to write the book then? The book is the book I wish I'd read after about two years of uh, investing. Yes. So I was relatively active, reading a lot of stuff on forums, starting to buy books on the topic of investing and kind of getting into building my knowledge. And the book isn't a beginner's book. It doesn't explain the sort of kind of terms. Hopefully it's easy for people to read. I try and put examples that from my own investing or from famous investors that illustrate the points, but yeah. it's very much a book that mirrors my own journey as, as an investor and things that I found the hard way that yeah. I wish I'd I had this book. As and we I, all do. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think I, I found there was a, a gap in the market for this type of book. There was a lot of books re written about your next great stock, but very little that told you how do you build those stock picks into a coherent portfolio. So that the kind of last part of the book is really about portfolio management, how much of a stock you should own, potentially ideas for when you should buy and when you should sell your particular yeah. investments. But uh, again, I am of a time where behavior investing became a big thing in that kind of late 2000s. You've got quite a lot of books written about this idea that we're not completely rational. Mm. We have this system one that jumps in with quick answers and often leads us astray, to be honest. It's good for quick decision making, but poor for the real considered decisions you really should be making as an investor. So I started to read books about this topic, yeah. but found them quite lacking. They were either a, a long list of here are all the biases that you have, which is great, but yeah no information on how you overcome them or the only ones that sort of had practical advice that you should be an index tracker investor you should be a passive investor now i think in passive investing is great for the vast majority of people but the example i always give is if your friends came to you for relationship advice and you said just break up with them that never quite sits with you because that isn't that isn't the it's advice not what you're that looking for <laughs> and that's not what you're looking for the certainly a good chunk of my book is dedicated to real practical ways investors can overcome these behavioral biases and often by putting sort of rules in place for yourself i think of it a, a bit like uh, odysseus tying himself to the mast you, you might think that rules 
are for beginners or rules for the people who aren't as sophisticated, but you often find that these behavioral biases are most concentrated in people who are clever, confident, it, all the things that most investors are. So we're often inexperienced as well. So yeah. we're often the people who are most susceptible to these sort of errors. And the book takes investors through kind of ways that experienced, intelligent investors can overcome some of these biases. Yeah, well, hopefully what we're going to do throughout this conversation is unearth some of those biases and you can share ways and means of how people mm -hmm. can first identify them and then actually solutions to, to work around them. So am I right in saying that you consider yourself a deep value investor? Yeah, the value investing idea has really resonated with me over my investing career. I think part of that, it was just the style that was in vogue when I started to invest. And it's perhaps one of the reasons that I picked up the UK Motley Fool boards as one of my kind of key sources of information was that yeah. was the kind of flavor of that, that investing board. But the more experienced I became, the more I found that there were certain aspects of value investing, buying cheap stocks, buying the things that people hate mm. usually, or almost being attracted to the things that people hate, attracted to companies that are hitting new lows, are in downtrends, have some of these factors that, that a lot of investors really dislike or can't cope with. It, it's something I can look into in the book as well is... I think that investors should really be tailing their strategy to their unique personality. And I have a personality trait called disagreeableness. It's not always considered a good trait because my wife, I often correct her rather than saying, oh yes, uh, listening to the, Ooh, you're you know, to the point she was making. <laughs> yes, I've survived so far. Yeah. The nature of it is people who are agreeable might find it really hard to be the sort of investor I am because the market every day is telling you you're wrong. It's going down. And if you don't have that um, independently say, no, no, I, I think I've done, I think I've done the maths. I think there's a high chance I'm right. Psychologically, you'll struggle with it. Yeah. But, and I think there's lots of ways to skin an investing cat. You can be a momentum investor. You can become a, a growth investor. I think quality investing is, uh, is another way. And all of these done well can deliver significant outperformance and yeah. it, it's less important to be a specific investor and follow specific methodology that works somebody else. It's much more important to build that philosophy, that investment philosophy and investment practice that matches your yeah. strengths and overcomes your weaknesses. So what sort of metrics then are you looking for? If you've got a company that's trending down, it's not very well liked in the marketplace. It's not the hot stock. It's just not really doing very well. How do you find these companies then? What metrics do you look for that identify them to actually, this is a value investment. This is something I need to be looking at. So often the sort of companies I'm looking for trade at a discount to their tangible book value. So that's all the, all the assets after they, after you take off all the liabilities mm. and ignoring intangibles as well. I think you can do very well investing in companies that have high intangibles, but if you're really looking for cheap, if you write off those intangibles and you still get something that looks very good value, there's a chance that it is. And I look for particularly liquid assets, such as cash inventories, things that can be turned into cash quickly. And I want to buy companies typically that trade at a discount to those assets. Yeah. And you don't get this sort of company when, you know, when everything's going right with this company. So some are loss making, some have maybe some litigation overhanging them. There's a reason why people dislike this sort of company yeah. or they look particularly high risk to a lot of investors. So people will not want to invest in companies that are high risk, but risk can be diversified. You can, you can hold many different companies that are cheap and at least idiosyncratic risk is, is then diversified away. And often problems with businesses can be fixed. That's how capitalism works, right? The pressure from shareholders means that the underperforming business sells off, closes or sells off underperforming business units. They have cost cutting rounds. They increase sales marketing, all the things that, you know, you want from a company, these companies do. And you often find that the business performance does actually turn around eventually. Yeah. And the price often, the turnaround in price often precedes the actual turnaround in, in business performance. Yeah. 
Yeah. Other investors anticipate it. An example, the company Czar, they do kind of industrial print heads. I first invested them when during kind of COVID pandemic, the share price was battered down till it was trading below the value of cash on the balance sheet, just because it was for sellers and kind of people had to exit the market for whatever reason. Yeah. And it, this is a loss making company. It was risky. It did have, but the discount became so big. I bought into the stock, maybe just to bull, below about 20 pence. And once the management sort of decided to turn it round, the losses became less. The share price started to go up, the confidence in the market returned. And as usual as a buy investor, I, I sold far too soon, but I think the current price is maybe about £1.60 and it had gone as high as sort of £2 something. And the business is still loss making. Now, my opinion now is it's probably a little bit overvalued considering you're paying a lot now for a loss making business. But the point is the performance of the stock price turned around far quicker than the actual performance of the business because people yeah. are now expecting this is going to grow for a number of years and maybe grow into this valuation that it now has that i think that's a good example of, of what i try to find yeah really good example so do you look for international stocks as it's solely just uk based stocks so i tend to stick in the uk i have invested into international companies but perhaps only if i want access to a particular part of the market and you can't get it in the UK market, I think invested in some tanker stocks like a year or so ago because they look very good value, but you just couldn't get them in, in the yeah. UK. But typically I stick with the UK because I have quite a good radar for mm. promotional management. If some things might be frauds or story stocks. I get the feeling in the UK, I've got enough experience to, to know when things might not quite be right. Yeah. Whereas if I invest in a Japanese stock, for example, I have no way of checking that out. And I don't necessarily understand the cultural norms. I might not understand when results are due or how to get access to those results, or probably won't be able to join your management calls, for example. And I don't find that restricts me. It's often a big bias is everybody invests in their home market and become massively exposed to the economics of their own home country. Whereas I find that there's companies listed on the UK stock exchange where I can access to American construction. I can, it can be gold mining in Africa, it can yeah. be a, any number of aspects of the economy are available in the UK. Yeah. There's quite a lot of international stocks, isn't there, on the UK stock market because of its size and liquidity. And as you pointed yeah. out there, it's a well-regulated stock market, so it's trusted by a lot of big companies, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's give a pretty good overview of what you look for and how you identify stocks. As we like move down to your portfolio, how many sort of stocks do you hold in your portfolio then? How many do you manage? So my target is probably somewhere between 20 and 30. If I find times, so probably in the middle of last year, I found that there wasn't a lot of things available. So I tended to focus my portfolio a bit more on the fewer stocks that I considered kind of good value now or a couple of months ago, it feels a bit more like a shotgun market than a sniper market. You could almost invest across 20 stocks that were looked good value on a number of metrics. My target is that kind of 20 to 30 range. I think there's enough for me to understand each company in detail, but not probably would not like to go below that sort of 15 to 20 level because yeah. I end up too concentrated in, again, this idiosyncratic risk. Diversification is the only thing you can overcome those sort of risks. Yeah. So you keep it above that 15 to 20 mark to help with the diversification, which yeah helps lower the risk yeah understand yeah. would you mind sharing one or two stocks that you hold as like you've got a strong conviction and why you've got a strong conviction in, in them and how you came across them when you bought them yeah sure probably the first one i'll highlight is one called capital limited so it used to be called capital drilling and still a significant portion of their business is providing drilling rigs to mainly gold producers in Africa. And they, particularly on the drilling side, they've got a pretty decent gross margin. It's somewhere between sort of 40 and 50% of you that they don't declare it as a individually. So you have to do a little bit of a little bit of, of digging. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit of digging or just estimating basically. Yeah. And so they do quite well. And it's another one where it's quite hard for a competitor to come in. So there are competitors, but being able to operate across multiple jurisdictions within kind of Africa, 
takes a lot of experience, takes, you know, it's a challenging environment. And I think people consider it quite a risky stock for this reason. And I wouldn't say it's low risk, but it perhaps is, is lower risk than people might assume. It's very much the picks and shovel end of the market, the famous story that the people who got rich in the gold rush were the people who provided the picks and shovels, not the miners themselves. So it's the sort of ultimate picks and shovels company. And they trade on a, a sort of forward e 2 bit dar of around two, which puts them really at the cheapest end of the market. I don't think they should be particularly highly rated because this is a capital intensive industry. At the moment, they're investing a lot of their cash flow earnings back into new rigs, new mining equipment, because the cycle is booming at the moment. And there is an aspect of, I guess, people fear this is the top of the market and the top of the cycle. There's very little sign of this market slowing down. This is another kind of thing I'm a big fan of is the capital market cycle theory. Have you come across this? No, but please share. Um, So the idea is particularly on industries like mining, where the, it takes a long time to get a mine into production. Mm -hmm. You get these long cycles of under investment, the commodities weak. So nobody wants to invest. And then mines produce the price, of the commodity goes up as the mines, certain mines start to run out of production yeah. and then prices go up and that encourages the companies to start new mines, new mines bring new discover mines more stuff. Yeah, exactly. So it's why you get this kind of cyclical, these yeah. are cyclical businesses, but because of the time it takes to build a new mine, you actually get quite good returns when things are booming and the cycles can last longer. And I think in this case. COVID has meant that there has been an underinvestment. So this company potentially is in this still nice growing part of the cycle. And on top of this, they've got quite a fast growing business called MSA Labs, which provides the essaying in the lab. And they're rolling out a technology called Chrysos, which is a listed company in Australia, who use effectively a non-destructive way of measuring the gold in samples. And it's just a, a quicker and better way of doing this. And there's no a, a sort of official partnership, but Capital or MSA Labs and, and therefore Capital are a, an early adopter of this. And Brysos are, are renting them the machines. So there's very little CapEx involved. And this company's growing revenue at something like 100% per, per annum. Wow. At the moment. Yeah, good. Yeah, very uh, good. At, and Capital own sort of 75% this with the management of MSA Labs owning the rest. So you've got a, yeah, a very cheaply rated stock with a growth stock in there as well. Some conservative estimates that if they traded on the same sort of multiples of the, as their competitors and you allocated a sort of typical, a fairly conservative growth stock, um, valuation on the MSA labs part, you get a, a valuation, maybe about twice the current share price. Again, yeah. it's a risky stock. It involves potentially a re-rating. Uh, and this is one of the criticisms of this company is it's, is never yet re-rated. It's just continue generating good results and yeah. it, it's never re-rated. But for me as a value investor, the primary thing is the valuation. I try not to play too many games of what if, when is somebody, when is there going to be a catalyst? When is somebody going to get excited by this stock? Because I'm just quite a poor judge of yeah. those things. I'm hopefully a good investor and I'm a terrible trader. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I play to my strengths, which is kind of valuation, valuing companies and looking through short-term setbacks to longer-term performance, but I'm a terrible trader. So I try not to second guess when the market is going to become excited by this stock or not. I think fundamentally stocks are worth the net present value of the dividends and the share buybacks and the per share that they release to shareholders. And if this company doesn't re-rate, it will gradually just keep paying higher and higher dividends and you will see these cash returns eventually. Yeah. So it's a win-win anyway for you, isn't it? Being an investor, if you're getting ever increasing dividends, you still yeah you're still winning aren't you even if it doesn't re-rate to what you think it perhaps should be yeah it's still a winning a winner anyway for the increasing dividends and that's a, a great example and i hope the audience has enjoyed that one so in your book you talk about whether an, an investor should average down or cut their losses if we use capital as a as an example let's say it doesn't do what you think it might do 
and it starts to lose value, how would you assess when it's time to cut your losses? Or would you average down? I think this is one of the big controversies in investing. You can start fights at, a, at an investment conference by <laughs> mentioning this topic. Yeah, if you wrote it in a forum chat or something, it would be like, we're pressing a nuclear button or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people have very strong opinions because certain things work for them or don't work for them. And I think this comes down to this idea of style. I think certain types of investors really need to be cutting their losses, particularly momentum investors, people who may be some more kind of growthy investors, just stop losses kind of work for them. However, my style of investing, kind of value investing, the typical stop loss strategy works particularly well for a value investor. And the reason is you're already buying something that's hated yeah. and you don't know when it's going to turn around. Okay. And if a gap between your perceived valuation and the current market price is the reason you've bought and the price goes down, you really should be buying more in my opinion. But with the caveat that some great value investors have really become unstuck averaging down. And I've, I've got an example in my book, which kind of goes into more detail, but the, the principle is that some stuff just keeps going down, but potentially a value trap is in my mind is something that has a, a gap to intrinsic value, but mm. the intrinsic value keeps going down and the discount stays the same. Although yeah. you go, and I think this quote catches a lot of value investors out because you, you go, ah, oh, but there's a, but there's a gap in that intrinsic value. This should be a buy or I should add to it, but then the intrinsic value keeps going down because yeah. of the poor performance of the business. And maybe this turnaround never arrives or it arrives too late and you've invested too much capital and already lost too much money. So what I like is there's a Australian hedge fund manager called John Hempton. He wrote a blog about this topic and I, his insight is probably the clearest I've come across about this. And is if you're going to average down, have a limit to how much of your portfolio you're ever willing to put in that stock. So if you know that you only ever buy up to 5% of the value of your portfolio hmm. into any one stock, it's kind of like you've got that amount of money to play with. And the question is, when do you deploy it? And if you know it's limited, you're probably more likely to pause a little bit rather than, okay, I add some fresh capital every 5% down. It might be wait and go, okay, 10 to 20% down. I add a little bit more and, and then the most you can lose is that 5% hmm. of that particular stock. It, yeah. It's like, you're not going to keep averaging, averaging down. And the, the example in the book is Sequoia that averaged down on a, a company called Valiant Pharmaceuticals. And they ended up with something like 20% of their portfolio in this stock. And they, I think they had something like a, took over a 30% loss on this single stock because yeah, they kept yeah. averaging down and, and they're that there were actually issue, their fundamental issues with the business itself. That's a really good example for how one can manage the average down versus the cut losses kind of example. It's just, I guess that comes into the root rules before you even would purchase a stock, doesn't it? So even before you go into make your first purchase, before you even found the stock that you're going to buy, okay, I'm only risking 5% into this stock of my portfolio. Or yeah. whatever, whatever it might be, six, seven, eight yeah. percent. Mm. Yeah. Where I do think stop losses could be potentially useful for a sort of value investor is on the other side, on the exiting a profitable investment. So certainly one of the, take the example of Zar, for example, I was selling from over a pound pretty much and was probably completely out by one pound 20. And then the stock doubled from there is like, I have a tendency to sell too soon. You have to be careful because on average, that probably works out. If you think something's overvalued and you know, you've got something else that looks quite undervalued, yeah, you yeah. probably are better switching, but potentially one of the things people can do is have this kind of trailing stop loss. So once you've decided something is fully valued, but has positive momentum, you can potentially hold until it, until that momentum yeah. fades, either using something like the momentum rank on Stockopedia or moving averages or, or just a, a strict sort of percentage, yeah. 15% yeah. or something like that. And potentially that could help investors capture a bit more of the upside. Of course, none of these things are cost free in that by definition, you are selling on the way down. So the stock will have peaked. And for most people, the idea that you fail to sell at the top is really psychologically hard. And the risk is 
even though you've like you've set this kind of strategy this is a good strategy once it starts falling you start to regret not selling the stop and the, at the top and you never sell and yeah. you just track it all the way back down to you know to where it started or even worse so that's the yeah the none of these things are easy if they were everybody would be a successful yeah. investor and i guess this is the biases that you delve into in the book isn't it because the ability for the for the investor to manage the open profits and sell at the right time is equally as challenging as, as when the investor is in a losing position and it's knowing when to sell it's one's in, in profit one's in a loss but yeah pitfalls are the same aren't they yeah, yeah. and i think the other factor is it it, it isn't it, you can tune around the edges it's not it's not i own this stock or i don't own this stock mm. it's what's the right proportion of my portfolio that should be in this stock now yeah and therefore if something goes up it might still be a buy if fundamentally the business outlook has got much much better but often i'll want to top slice just for the risk factor if i have something that's uh, by a reasonable percentage and it it goes up it, it's probably it goes up significantly it's probably looking too big a portion of my portfolio and i want to avoid those risks like the meteor hitting their head office or their product getting massive recalls or something like that the black swan event yes exactly yeah um, and i guess that's where you could top your top slice and move the stop loss up into a profitable position so that it's a win-win isn't it as well yeah then? i guess a stop loss doesn't protect you against fraud being found and it'd be suspended at yeah. 7, 7 a.m the next morning so <laughs> I, again that's the thing of i think it's a stop loss is a useful thing but it's no substitute for limiting the maximum percentage you'll have in any one stock yeah. because any stock can go to zero and it can go to zero like before you have any chance to sell yeah how much time do you spend researching these companies finding these companies I guess like many investors, I have a, a kind of spreadsheet that tracks my portfolio and like many investors, I fall for the bias of checking it every day. And in some ways there's good reason you might want to top slice. You might want to rebalance because things have got out of whack, but generally mm. things don't move that quickly. So it's totally a sort of a bias of wanting action and wanting to see what's going on. Yeah. But what I find, what I have in that sort of tracking spreadsheet is I don't have any monetary values because you can have a tendency to freak yourself out. Mm -hmm. If you are successful investor for a period of time, you might have a, a portfolio of a certain size. If you're managing your own SIP, for example, and you've got a few kind of 10, 20 years of contributions, it's likely to be a significant amount of money compared to your weekly Aldi shop. I'm a value mm -hmm. investor, so I shop <laughs> at Aldi. And you don't want to freak yourself out either that you've lost a certain amount of money on a particular day or if you've got a really great idea you don't want to bulk and say okay i really should have put five percent of my portfolio in but i only put three percent in because it it seemed like a lot of money mm -hmm. and the other the other side as well is when you're when you're building up your portfolio and it's small maybe smaller amounts of money you don't want to be like the gambler you don't want to be oh it's only uh yeah it's only a month's savings so i'm happy to risk it on something that's completely yeah. You know, black <laughs> yes exactly so yeah so i try not to show any monetary values and i also hide any profit and loss on any individual position yeah. okay because for the same reason that tends to introduce biases a an example would be i invested in the company cmc markets one of the kind of spread bet companies i lost faith of how the management were going the costs were overrunning this new platform of non-leveraged finance they're bringing out just was Mm. just seems to take forever and cost far more and I, so lost faith in the management decided to sell and logged into my portfolio on the broker app and saw that i was going to lose i don't know say six percent on this particular sale and i felt myself have the thing of oh maybe i should wait till it goes yeah. up six percent to get and of course my buy price is nonsense a financial psychologist guy calls it get even yeah. you want to get even yeah. and that that's one of those worst biases you can have because you've lost faith in the management i should sell whether i've made six percent profit sixty percent profit six percent loss six percent loss there's no that has no bearing on whether i should yeah. continue my investment so so it's like the story's changed it's not what it was when you bought it that's where you would say i'm out 
Yeah. Absolutely. And and hiding those kind of profit loss figures really helps with that, with that sort of decision making. So let's say that you're just starting your investing journey now, or you're speaking to the audience who was new and just starting. What would you say to them? What would you share with them from your own experience to how they can develop their own strategies? Yeah, I think the most important thing is to do that, to find what works for you in yeah. investing. There's lots of mistakes you can make, but there's, there's often no right way to invest. You can learn from examples of great investors. You can learn from other resources and podcasts and discussing these things, but really just, yeah, take the time to develop your own strategy, find what works for you. Hopefully my book can be one, one of the stepping stones on that yeah. and help you to think through your strategy, how you should overcome these behavioral biases, avoid mistakes, and hopefully have a strategy for portfolio management for knowing how much you should invest in, in each stock. And hopefully that is a book that will help you to do that. Yes. And I, I'll reiterate your book, Excellent Investing, really good read. So I'd highly recommend it. The link will be in the show notes. So please just scroll down. You'll find it there. And then Mark, where can the audience follow, connect with you so they can learn more from you? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at Danger Capital. It's based on my joke hedge fund name. <laughs> and I have a Discord server called Small Caps Live, where we discuss all things small cap investing so feel free to join us there and yeah have your say and debate the sort of stocks we're interested in brilliant and i will make sure all those links are in the show notes below so as i say scroll down all the links will be there and you can follow connect and learn more from mark thank you very much mark really enjoyed the conversation today thanks lee good to be here yeah take care bye